All right, let's get started, guys. So the next talk is the evolution of mage card attacks. And our speakers for today are Gal Meir and Roman Lewiski. I'm sorry if I got the name incorrectly, but yeah, I'm gonna give it to you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, so hello and thanks for coming. Um, my name is Gal Meiri and here with me is Roman Lewowski. And today we're gonna talk about the evolution of MageCart, which is an uh, ongoing research that we are doing for almost three years. As part of the talk, we'll show you some techniques that attackers do in order to uh, complicate their attacks and make them more uh, sophisticated and harder to detect. Let me start with uh, uh, introducing ourselves. So I'm Gal, I'm leading the threat research team uh, of Akamai Zine Browser Protection Group. Roman here is part of the team. Our main field of expertise is uh, uh, client-side security, everything that happens inside the browser in terms of uh, JavaScript injection, uh, mage cut obviously, but also ad injection, affiliate fraud attacks, info stealers, and so on. And also uh, a bit of uh, phishing detection. The agenda for today will be separated into three main parts. We will start with a short introduction about MageCart. We'll talk about what it is, how it looks like, and what makes it uh, be so dangerous. After that, we will get to the main focus point of this talk, the advanced attack methods. There we will talk about hiding methods and data exfiltration methods. Uh, we will talk about the differences between them uh, later. And we will end up with mitigations and protections. So let's start with the introduction to MageCart. Uh, MageCart, also called uh, web skimming or form jacking attack, is a kind of attack where the attacker injects a piece of malicious JavaScript code into targeted websites in order to steal uh, their end user sensitive data. In most cases, we are talking about um, e commerce websites where the attacker injects its code into the checkout pages of these websites and, of course, aims to steal the uh, end user sensitive information such as payment information, credit card data, and so on. The attack flow, so the end user browses online, gets to uh, a, a targeted website and reaches the checkout page. There he enters his sensitive information and the JavaScript behind the scenes takes this information and exfiltrates it to the command and control server. After that, the checkout process continue as usual. What makes MageCart uh, so dangerous compared to other, other kinds of uh, um, client-side attacks? So first of all, this is a server-side server originated attack. The attack itself is delivered as part of the site. The code itself is coming as any other resource of the website from the server side to the web browser. As opposed, uh, as opposed to um, other client-side threats that usually come as part of uh, malware or a malicious uh, extension that installed on the end user machine, here we are talking about something that comes from the server side and infects all the sessions of the targeted website. It also sets the responsibility for the attack on the website owners and not on the end, end user itself. Second, the number of affected users. As the attack comes from the server side, um, uh, as the attack comes from the server side, every session of the website is infected. And in fact, every user that will enter his sensitive information into the checkout page will be a target and a victim of this attack. And last, this is a silent execution attack. It means that it does nothing to the user experience. It does not sh uh, show pop-ups or things like that on top of the screen. Everything is concluded on one single request that is being sent from the web browser to the attacker's command and control server behind the scenes. Let's take a look on a very basic attack example. So we have here uh, 20 lines of JavaScript code that perform a generic mage card attack. Um, at first, we register to an event on the page. Here we will look for mouse over event over the submit button in the page. When it will be triggered, we will start with the data collection. We will iterate over all the input fields in the page. We'll take their name or ID and, um, of course, their value with the sensitive information as part of it. And in the end, we'll send it as a simple XHR request to the uh, command and control server. Uh, and that's it. We also recorded it uh, here a demo ahead to connect all the points. So um, this is a checkout page that we created for this demo. 
On the right side you can see the attacker's command and control server. As part of this uh, page we injected the same simple codes that I just showed. Now we will fill in the sensitive inf information. And once I will uh, hover with my uh, pointer over the place order button, you will be able to see a request being sent from the browser to the attacker's uh, uh, command and control server with all the sensitive information as part of it. Uh, in a very few words about the infection methods, how sites getting infected with MageCart. So we see two main vectors of infection. F the first one is a direct first party infection. Here we are talking about exploitation of known vulnerabilities, vulnerabilities and CVEs that exist as, as part of the technologies that the website is built with or usage of um, leaked credentials and tokens and using them accessing uh, storage containers and injecting the JavaScript to there. The second vector is supply chain attacks. Here we don't target specifically and directly the website itself. We target a third party vendor or a third party service that is loaded as part of the site, injecting the JavaScript to this vendor and using its access to the website we actually uh, get access uh, for the uh, malicious script. So now we have the basic understanding of what mage card attacks are and let's uh, talk about the main focus point of this talk, the advanced attack methods. I will say ahead, um, some of the methods that we will show not right now are relevant for any kind of JavaScript injection and not only for mage card, but we will focus on the mage card perspective of this kind of uh, uh, techniques. And first, uh, let me start with uh, the hiding methods. So hiding methods refer to anything that attackers do in order to implement the attack in a more silent way in the website, something that will give it a more legitimate sense, and things that will complicate, it, that will complicate the reverse engineering of the uh, malicious code, and uh, will help in order to evade from static scanners. And I will start with the very basic one, I guess those of you who are familiar with JavaScript uh, won't consider it as something sophisticated, uh, obfuscation, basically in a language that can take this simple command line and show it like that. Uh, you can do almost everything. And this is exactly what obfuscation is about. Uh, taking a clear code, taking its variable names and uh, strings and transforming them in a way that, will, that they will be less readable and harder to uh, understand. And complicating also the uh, code execution flow in order to complicate the reverse engineering of the code. The motivation here is, again, to complicate the reverse engineering of the code and also hiding uh, IOCs that exist as part of it. On the other hand, as you can see, it makes the code look very suspicious. Uh, here you can see two examples of the same simple codes that I just showed you uh, being obfuscated with two of the most common obfuscators in the field. And as you can see, they look pretty suspicious. Next, we have abusing known services. Uh, as you can imagine, a major part of the decision whether something is malicious or not is based on uh, where it comes from, the domain name that the attack is loaded from, and where it sends the data to, uh, where the, the domain name that it connects to. Uh, attackers uh, use known services and abuse them in order to inject the uh, malicious code to the page and use the um, uh, domain name reputation of these known services. In most cases, we are talking about tag managers. Here you can see an example of a real attack that used Google Tag Manager in order to inject the image card code to the page. Um, on the first image, you can see the actual malicious code as part of the gtm.js tag. After that, it being rendered in the page. And in the third image there, you can see the actual image card request with sensitive information being sent. And the initiator is gtm.js, uh, Google Tag Manager.js. The motivation, uh, as you can see, the initiator of this, this attack is googletagmanager.com, a domain name that um, static scanners won't suspect and consider something malicious. And uh, it will help uh, attackers in order to evade from static analysis scanners. And that's it. Next, we have the scriptless infection. Here, uh, the motivation of the attacker is to separate the uh, 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 injection into a loader, a very basic one, that will bring the actual malicious code as a, an asynchronous request, and then we'll evaluate it on the page. 
Uh, as you can see in the example here, we have a very basic XHR request that calls and imports the actual uh, code as a, an XHR request and then evaluates it on the page. The motivation, the actual malicious code is not stored on a specific file, so scanners and static scanners uh, won't be able to uh, take it and analyze it uh, statically. And also the request initiator itself, in most cases, will be the page URL itself as the loader is mostly injected as an inline script to the page and then when it evaluates the code, it will remain with its uh, uh, initiator. So attackers took the idea of separating the attack into a loader and uh, uh, a resource that comes after, at, after it to the next step in what we call two-step loaders. Uh, Two-step loaders refer to loaders that bring to the page the malicious code, not as a clear JavaScript code, but as something else, such as image or a CSS file. Take a look on the example here. You can see on the left side uh, the loader that is injected to the page. Uh, and as part of it, it calls a file named stylesheet.css. On the right side, you can see the CSS, CSS file. Um, theoretically, it looks like a valid uh, re regular CSS. But if you'll take a look behind the scenes, you can see that um, it contains a lot of white spaces as part of it. What happens here, the loader takes those white spaces and from them decodes the actual malicious code and then executes it on the page. Again, the motivation is to evade from static scans. The actual malicious code is not stored in a file or a JavaScript tag. It comes from another resource that uh, uh, later is uh, decoded and executed on the page. One particular use case of two-step loaders is steganography. Um, here we are talking about web scheming, uh, mage card attacks that inject to the page both a loader and a hidden image. And then the loader takes this image and from it extracts the actual malicious code and evaluates it on the page again. The motivation is the same. There is no specific file that contains the actual malicious code. It is decoded on the go uh, as part of the website execution. Another way to run JavaScript outside of a script tag is running in a non-script tag. Take a look at the example here. You can see uh, an image tag that we created with a source that does not really exist. And we set for this image tag an on-error attribute. Once the image will be failed to be imported to the page, uh, this JavaScript will be executed and initiate the image card attack on the page itself. Uh, static scanners tend to scan the, the, the website and take only the script tags as part of it. In that case, we will be able to evade from them as the JavaScript will be run outside of a regular script tag in the page. Last, let's say that I'm a security researcher and I understand that something is wrong about a specific script and I want to investigate and reverse engineer it. We saw many cases where attackers injected to the page uh, anti-debugging mechanisms uh, to, the, to the script, sorry, anti-debugging mechanisms that complicate the reverse engineering of the code and sometimes even make it impossible to understand what it performs without modifying and removing this piece of code from the uh, injection. The most common one is DevTools check. You can see on the screen right now two uh, techniques that uh, attackers uh, use in order to detect these DevTools uh, uh, in the browser. In most cases, the DevTools check comes with a self-destruction mechanism. Once detected, the attack stops immediately, removes all the traces from the page, and we even saw some use cases where the attacker actually burned the IP address of the machine that we uh, browsed from in order to make sure that the same code won't be delivered to it again. And now Roman will explain you about the data exfiltration methods. Yeah, so, so on the next couple of slides, I will uh, talk about the last phase of typical match card attack, which is the data exfiltration phase. Um, so the, the idea here is to exfiltrate the stolen data to the command and control server of the attacker uh, in a most evasive uh, way and, and avoid detection. So uh, the first technique, it's a very common and it's used not only in match card but also in other attacks, type of attacks as well, uh, obfuscation and encryption. So uh, the, uh, the attacker will try to send the data and obscurely and not as a plain text uh, in order to make the text unreadable 
Uh, so there are different types of encoding techniques and uh, obfuscation techniques, uh, encoding and encryption techniques. Uh, one of the most common techniques that we encountered in recent match code campaigns was uh, were, was uh, uh, Base64 uh, encoding. In some more advanced cases, we encountered uh, even uh, asymmetric encryption. Uh, there is an example here uh, of a case where uh, encryption was used uh, in order to encrypt the sensitive stolen data. Uh, so the next technique, uh, the usage of WebSockets. So WebSockets is a, a communication protocol for a persistent uh, bidirectional communication between uh, browsers and servers. And um, um, the attackers, uh, the match code campaign, attackers usually use uh, WebSockets for two main uh, purposes. Uh, the first one is to fetch the malicious code. And the second one is to uh, exfiltrate the stolen data using the same WebSocket channel uh, that created in order to fetch the malicious code. It's considered uh, a less common and a more discreet uh, uh, a network, network transmission NPI and uh, compared to a traditional uh, transmission request, like uh, tra transmission method like the XHR uh, and fetch request. Uh, and this way, the attackers can, uh, in some cases, evade better from evade better from uh, static uh, uh, security security solutions and uh, static uh, uh, scanners that may run on the affected page. Uh, regarding the one one more word about the example, so the example here uh, uh, illustrate how WebSocket is connected uh, is uh, initiated on the page. Uh, and uh, the, the, the WebSocket channel that uh, it creates and used in order to uh, fetch and exfiltrate the data. Uh, the usage of uh, the next technique is a, a, the a utilization of HTML tags. Uh, so this technique, uh, the main advantage of this technique is that the attackers use uh, um, HTML tags like image tags, anchors, uh, and links, and links um, uh, those those type of tags uh, initiate network requests. The attacker use uh, these tags in order to uh, exfiltrate the data. They are doing it by uh, concatenate uh, the stolen data, the sensitive data, as a query param to these requests, to those this type of requests. Uh, and this way, they, the 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 network request will be sent uh, to the command and control server of the attacker. Uh, uh, the main advantage of uh, of this technique is, in some cases, it can bypass con uh, uh, content security uh, policy uh, uh, restrictions that usually uh, target uh, 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 script domains. Um, there is an example here that uh, illustrates how how this how this technique is works. So there is a malicious code. In this case, the malicious code is obfuscated. Uh, you can see it creates an image tag where the SRC. Uh, points to the command and control server of the attacker, uh, and the uh, stolen data uh, attached to, to the query params uh, of the request as a base64 encoded string. Uh, once I decoded the, the string, uh, you can see the, uh, in clear text uh, the data that, that is sent out uh, to the attacker. Uh, the next technique. Uh, so there are cases, in, in many cases, uh, uh, websites usually e-commerce websites, but not only, uh, use uh, third-party services for their uh, checkout uh, process. So in such cases, they, they're doing it by, uh, um, uh, by the usage of iframes or some external third-party uh, pages. In such cases, the, attacker, the, the malicious code that injected by the attackers they won't have access to the sensitive fields. Uh, and and there, there will be no uh, option for the attackers to, to, to read the sensitive data. So to bypass, to work around uh, this issue, uh, the attackers use a technique we call fake forms. They create, the malicious code creates a fake form that mimics the original form uh, that uh, the website is implement. Uh, the fake form injected as an overlay on top of the original form uh, and once the data is entered, is submitted, uh, there, uh, the, the, uh, the attacker will send it, uh, send it back to his command and control server. The example here show how it's done. You can see uh, two iframes. Uh, the top one is the original form, which is hidden, uh, and the second uh, and the second iframe is uh, an iframe that uh, injected by the attacker and shown on top of the original one. 
By the way, this is uh, the only technique that actually uh, impacts uh, the user experience since it requires the user to enter his credit card details, his personal details, twice. Uh, so it's a quick demo from a real, uh, from a real attack, uh, from a real website that was attacked uh, recently um, that uh, combines all the techniques that I showed till now, that I presented up till now. So there is a fake form that injected first. Uh, once the user submits the data, you can see that uh, a web uh, you can see the WebSocket channel on the right side. Uh, the, the personal data is sent as a base64 encoded string in this uh, WebSocket channel. Uh, and once I took this string and uh, uh, decoded it, uh, I found out that the request included all the uh, sensitive data that was entered to the fake form. The form that you see now on the screen is the original one, uh, which presented only after uh, the data is submitted uh, the first time on the fake, inside the fake, fake form. Um, the next technique is abusing known services. So the idea here is using a well-known and trusted services uh, that, uh, uh, any, uh, like Telegram or Google Tag Manager, uh, and use those services uh, in order to exfiltrate the stolen data. Uh, I created, we recorded a quick demo here. Uh, uh, so you can uh, uh, see how it's done using Telegram uh, bot channel. So once the sensitive data on this page is submitted, uh, the malicious code initiates a network request that sent to a, a, a Telegram uh, resource. Uh, but behind the scenes, it's a Telegram bot channel that's owned by the attacker. Uh, once the payload uh, arrives, uh, the, 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 uh, the stolen data attached as an encrypted string, once we decrypt it, again, we reveal the data that was sent out. Uh, last but not least, the last technique is uh, slow bridge. It's a less common technique. The idea here is to split the exfiltration phase uh, into uh, two, two steps. Uh, so the first step will be on the sensitive page itself. Once the sensitive data, the credit card data, for example, uh, um, uh, will, be sub uh, will be entered into the form, uh, the malicious code will save it uh, temporarily in one of the available, available uh, browser storages, like session storage, it can be uh, uh, local storage or cookies in some cases. Um, and then uh, the malicious code will wait for user navigation, and only on, after the user navigation, uh, the, malicious, uh, the, sensitive dat the malicious code will read uh, the data from the, the browser storage and send it back to his command and control server. Uh, it can be a good technique uh, to evade from uh, security solutions that usually uh, run in a more strict way on the sensitive page itself, like the login page or checkout page. So this was the uh, advanced exfiltration techniques. Uh, the, last, uh, the last part I want to talk about the protection and mitigation uh, um, techniques. So we split them into two, three main groups, uh, in-browser solutions, off-browser solutions, and runtime solution. As a side note, uh, I will add here that uh, the latest PCI DSS uh, security regulations that uh, released May um, last year uh, now requires uh, each and every company or website that process uh, credit card payment data to implement uh, uh, browser, uh, security measures and solutions uh, against match card. So the first group, uh, we, uh, what we call in-browser solutions. So the in-browser solutions, uh, uh, two, two main techniques, two main mechanisms are um, content security policy headers, I, uh, I mentioned them before, and sub-resource uh, sub integrity. Uh, so these mechanisms can provide some, some, uh, 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 some protection against match card. Uh, the main disadvantages that it's hard to maintain them each and every uh, update inside the script or each and every new script that added to the page will require uh, some updates, uh, some update in those mechanisms. They are not running in the same context uh, as the page, and they won't provide uh, protection if the malicious code injected is part of a third-party script um, that, uh, a legit third-party script that are uh, running on the page. Uh, our browser solutions, we are talking about uh, scanner or sandboxes that are ex external to the browser, uh, and they are trying to scan, run synthetic sessions and scan uh, the website. Uh, the main disadvantages of this group I uh, is that uh, in some cases, in many cases, we, we encountered 
uh, bot detection mechanisms, Gal uh, showed some of them, uh, that implemented in order to detect scanners. Um, and the second advantage that, that in, in case of session sampling, um, um, the scanner may miss uh, the, the, sc the, the scanner may miss uh, the execution of the malicious code. Uh, the last group, uh, runtime solutions, we are talking about uh, uh, JavaScript services that are loaded as part of the page together with the page. They are running on real session on, in the same context. Um, they have the ability to detect suspicious behaviors like interaction of uh, malicious scripts with sensitive fields, uh, different anomalies, and other uh, suspicious indicators. Uh, they are running in, in real time and in runtime, uh, and this is why they are considered a very effective, one of the more effective uh, type of solution uh, against match card. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Hope, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed. That's it.